Um, I will be talking about the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Drupal here today. Um, can we get maybe just like a little stretch, a little bit of stand up, a little energy? I know it's the very end of the, the camp. Just to be here with me. To, oh, walking all the way up, Benji, I appreciate it. Ooh, some push-ups. <laughs> Handstand. You win. You win the prize. And you're still standing. Well done. Well, I'll keep going. Um, yeah, y'all should be caffeinated. I know it was just coffee break time. So, uh, yeah, so we're here talking about uh, Jekyll and Drupal. Um, and here, of course, at Drupal Camp, New Jersey, uh, here on beautiful Princeton's campus. This is my first time. Um, so there's that work of art. Um, let's let that just sink in for a second, and we'll come back to it. Uh, I want to introduce myself first. Um, who am I? Not necessarily going through an identity crisis, but I do know who I am. I'm either that guy or it turns out to be this guy, the one looking at y'all. Um, I think I know who I am. Um, I've been doing Drupal for about almost 11 years now, um, which probably some could match that. Uh, I used to go by Ill Master C back in my earlier days, and then I thought uh, it would be a good idea to pretend like I had grown up and use my actual name as my moniker. So um, this is a sort of a means of hiding from my former self. Dun -dun -dun -dun. Um, but it's fair to say that uh, pretty much, oh, uh, if this will work, I hope the audio will work. Every day I'm Every day I'm That's sad. Um, this is the Every Day I'm Drupalin' video. I gotta say, hands down, the best Drupal slash cocaine trafficking song parody out there. No better, no, no, none could match it. Um, but <coughs> I noticed when I was, uh, let's see, is this working? Keep going. There we go. Uh, this is a new, new, VD, new Valley Media was the group that put that together. I noticed when I was checking out the parody, for those of y'all who don't know, is Rick Ross is a rapper, makes the song Every Day I'm Hustling. Uh, However, I couldn't help but notice that like, something looked slightly different from the video that I was used to in the new, Mal new Valley Media. I'm having a tough time. Group um, couldn't quite put my finger on it. Uh, relatedly, I, when I was watching the Every Day I'm Drupalin video, you know, the sidebar in YouTube that says you should check out these other songs, Weird Al's White and Nerdy came up. Um, <laughs> which is like in itself a true masterpiece. If y'all are not familiar, you should definitely check out White and Nerdy. It played at last year's uh, pre Dree's Note and we were giving it, uh, shouting it out. And not to beat this dead horse too much, but definitely some solid lyrics in this song, the Drupalin version. Um, they talk about Drush, all the Drupal things. It's, it's a pretty funny parallel. These are their own lyrics though, in which they leave drugs in a few times. I think it might've been an oversight, but that's what's up on YouTube. Um, and then one last Ruby gem uh, is uh, I've seen your content types. I don't need to know you to know that we ain't even in the same node queue. So there's that. <laughs> so much like those good folks, pretty much every day I'm Drupaling. Uh, when I'm not Drupaling, I'm often on a bicycle. This is me uh, getting ready to take the train up here to New Jersey uh, from my hometown, Durham. I like to bike helps me get my energy out, stay healthy. Um, I uh, made, a, with the help of a friend, a bicycle trailer out of a futon. Um, and I used that for this company that I started called Tilthy Rich Compost, which was a uh, help merge environmental passions and um, bicycle passions. Uh, we, we were a compost collection service for households in Durham. And, uh, and actually, third passion merged here. Uh, if you haven't already noticed, a uh, love for puns. Um, the word tilthy is a word I made up, so it's a tilthy rich is a pun. Tilth is like good soil condition. Um, so I got, got to really hit the trifecta there. And uh, we, uh, just in March, last March, uh, sold to a company com called Compost Now. It's really a coming together uh, company. So 
that's kind of my, my other life and that did overlap with my Savas Labs uh, life and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so I hope, I'll, I'll try to move through this quickly but um, when I'm not on my bike I just kind of want to give a, a sense of the kind of things I care about and, and the stuff that um, when I'm outside of Drupal, the passions that I have. And also, since it's the third day of Black Hist History Month, I wanted to kind of touch on some of those um, issues. Uh, and, and I'll try to make this quick. Um, <coughs> stuff that I care about is universal opportunity, and I think that takes lots of different forms. And I want to touch on a few of those uh, quickly here. Um, you know, clearly, uh, uh, groups that have been most categorically suppressed in the U.S. have been uh, African Americans in many cases. So as I think about this kind of vision, I want to invoke Dr. King's beloved community, you know, a world uh, free of discrimination and en enmity, and one that promotes equality, access, opportunity, and peace. And I also think about, you know, universal opportunity in the sort of founding Declaration of Independence with, um, you know, the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So I'm going to just touch on a few things very quickly. Um, you know, violence uh, against people of color is, a, is certainly an issue, something that we should be talking about during Black History Month. Um, as you can see, you know, this is tied in with the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, the stats you're looking at here is mapping violence and police violence report. Uh, uh, people of color, specifically black Americans, are three times as likely to be killed by police. I don't know if you all saw this, um, Lashia Evans, this was in Baton Rouge when there was a protest for the killing of Alton Sterling by police, which was after a spate of other uh, men of color, often unarmed, who were shot by police. Just such an a, a incredible, poignant shot, and she's so stoic And there. For a while, I thought this was three, three officers. They have so much riot gear and stuff on. It's actually only two guys, but um, I feel like kind of captures that uh, movement pretty well. Um, the, the sort of liberty aspect there, um, you know, we do live in a country where a large portion of the population is incarcerated, 4.5% of the world's population and 22% of the world's population prisoners. Um, so this is an economic policy institute that's also showing the huge disparities uh, per 100,000 people incarcerated amongst the race. Um, and there are also very large wealth disproportions, uh, white on the left, black on the right, um, as well as income the disproportion. Uh, basically, it's people of color, men and women, and the, the higher the number on the right, the more inequality. So things have actually gotten worse since the 70s. Uh, just a quick recommendation to The Color of Law. It's a book that talks a lot about these kind of structural things that have happened. Um, i also given a quick shout out to um, Richard Falk, who is uh, I've been a Princeton professor for 40 years, and he is the uh, founder of uh, or director of Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. So uh, it's just a, a time where we can use a little bit more peace, in my opinion. And there's a, a, a good book called uh, The Doomsday Machine written by Daniel Ellsberg. And there's also a movie out right now called The Post, which talks about the um, Pentagon Papers, which I have not seen yet, but I do recommend. Um, other things I care about, and and I'll get to what y'all care about really soon. Uh, universal health care, and I think of that in the uh, life, in the sort of well-being component, which was um, uh, prosperity, economics, and well-being were what the original drafters meant by the pursuit of happiness. Um, universal health care is defined by the World Health Organization as a situation where citizens can access health services without incurring financial hardship. Without going into too much detail, you know, you probably know that the U.S. has a very uh, high cost compared to many other countries and uh, some of the worst outcomes when it comes to infant mortality, life expectancy, curable deaths, efficiency, that sort of thing. Um, and then you know if, you know, Berkshire Hathaway and J.P. Morgan and Amazon are trying to get together to fix the system, like it's, it's probably pretty broken. Um, so there's lots of reasons for that, and I recommend this book, uh, An American Sickness. This has been a movement that's been going on for a long time. Really, uh, really good book that kind of chronicles the whole business of healthcare. <clears throat> and since we're in a you know esteemed uh, uh, institution of education, I just think uh, another uh, topic I care about is public education and folks uh, having that access. It's a big part of the pursuit of happiness to be able to 
attain a high level of education, of education and be self-actualized. Um, and also, obviously, economics come tied very tightly to education. A few quick stats. The, um, we have $1.5 trillion of student debt. That's compared to 60, $620 billion in just credit card debt. So, you know, twice in change uh, worse of a problem of debt than people spend on their credit cards, which is already a big problem. Um, the average 2016 graduate comes out with close to $40,000 in financial uh, loan debt, uh, student loan debt, and there's 44 million Americans under that debt. Um, and I won't, I won't stay too much on this, but Princeton, uh, the university that we're in, has got a $23.8 billion endowment. So maybe I shouldn't be talking about trying to make education too much cheaper, um, but to tie that into, um, and, that, and they're the t top four, there's three other universities higher, Yale, Harvard, and Stanford. And with an, uh, Princeton's uh, admission is uh, close to 70,000 a year or over 70,000 a year. And to just tie that back to the uh, theme of uh, Black History Month, and I promise I will get on after this, um, both Harvard and Yale uh, had professors, um, early on professor scholarship as well as build, financing buildings were financed off either the slave trade or uh, economic benefits from slaves, in the case of Harvard, from a sugar plantation in Antigua. So, you know, and, and I came upon this story which we're looking at, which is that Georgetown was literally saved in, I think, 1838 by selling 272 slaves that were owned by Georgetown. Um, I came upon this listening to a podcast called Uncivil. That's about the Civil War. It's very interesting. Um, but, you know, related to, of course, present day events. Okay. Thank you for tolerating that. And um, enough about me. Let's get into what you're here for. Actually, just a quick second. Do you think Burt Reynolds ever said, but enough about me? Does that look like, I, mean, I feel like he's just like, man, my beard looks real nice right now. Tell me more about me, not enough about me. Anyway, um, so, so let's get some things out of the way quickly. I'm not suggesting d diving into the Jekyll and Hyde and the Drupal and Jekyll situation. I'm not suggesting Drees is some evil Hyde figure um, and that he, he drinks a potion to make his hair stand up or something. Um, there really are no strong, significant literary tie-ins. And if you read closely uh, in the description, I may be alluded to that. So if you're like a super literary buff and, you, and you're going to be disappointed, you will be disappointed, but you're welcome to walk out now. I sort of made a, what I think to be a safe assumption that it wouldn't mean too much to y'all. If you're not familiar with the story, I'll tell it very quickly. It's basically a, supposed to be a theme of the duality of man, where we have evil and good within us. Um, Dr. Henry Jekyll is this, you know, esteemed, prestigious doctor in London in the 1800s, and he's got a laboratory, and he can drink a potion that turns him into hide, which is like this raw, sort of more animal instinct side of him. So they're one and the same, but the potion makes him switch back and forth. Um, <coughs> that's pretty much it. That's the story. Um, so what I really tell, want to talk to you all about today uh, for the rest of the 35 minutes is, um, you know, why we as an agency built, as a Drupal agency, built our website in Shekel and not Drupal. So I just wanted to set those expectations from the beginning because I know it's important. As I mentioned, you know, this is our, our home page, and maybe some of y'all are familiar with it by now, but if you're not, congrats for not being a stalker and for being present right now. Appreciate it. Uh, but we do clearly say we craft elegant Drupal web systems that propel organizations, so the question is then why do we choose Jekyll? And I will get into that. Uh, <coughs> quick overview. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Savas Labs, my company, why we selected Jekyll. We'll do a light dive into the Jekyll internals. Nothing too deep, but you should get pretty familiar with it if you're not. We'll talk about some of the strengths, and then uh, we'll bra brag quickly on some of the cool things that we built. And then uh, we'll talk about some sort of hindsight drawbacks and um, any other insights, takeaways that we, we learned from these last three years in that process. Um, main goals here would be to um, 
understand you know high level strengths of a static site generator. There's probably enough of that. It's hard to not stare at Lionel Messi. Um, you know specifically Jekyll. What are its strengths? Uh, what are static site generator strengths? Um, and again, some high level comparison to Drupal. To Drupal, some pros and cons. Um, I will show you how I think you know this decision making doesn't have to be very specific to Jekyll versus Drupal, but um, impacts other areas of the Drupal landscape. And I definitely want you all to take something valuable away, learn. Um, I'll share a lot of resources at the end. Uh, for good Googling folks, you may be able to find some of those resources before I share them, but I'll appreciate your waiting and paying attention in the meantime. Um, cool. So who we are, uh, we're Savas Labs. <coughs> this is what we look like, not staged at all around a table. We always look this, this way. Um, there are seven of us, three of, three of the team members here that you're looking at are distributed and the rest of, of the four of us are in Durham, North Carolina. Um, this is what we look like when we're looking at you, also pulled straight from our website. We have a partner network as well as the core team that you know allows us to double the size of our, our project load. Um, and we are hoping to add a new team member or two soon, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, we are Drupal experts. So even though we'll be talking a, a bit about Jekyll, um, we've got five Acquia uh, certified developers, five certifications, I should say, and we'll probably be closer to 10 in about a month. We've been running our local meetup in the Triangle, uh, North Carolina, which is about two million, you know, ge geographic area of about two million people for the last two years with the help of uh, Ruby Sinreich, who's um, been pretty instrumental in the diversity and inclusion work in the Drupal larger Drupal community. Uh, we've spoken at seven or scheduled to seven Drupal conferences um, and we've got over a thousand commits on D.O. We of course uh, share information on our blog and stuff like that too. Um, as I told you the puns are gonna they're gonna stay cheap um, and it won't be the last one so brace yourselves but we're more than that uh, we do it, we did value um, Establishing our values early on in the process, you know, very, very much from the beginning, um, and you know, you can see them here. The couple that I'll focus on is empathize, pretty simply, just be able to put yourself in other people's shoes, and be respectful, as we say it. Uh, and the way I think about being respectful is to, you know, maintain honesty and integrity, and we speak to that um, as well on our website. And I think ultimately, you know, when when you think that way, it. it ultimately sort of forces you to choose the right tool for the job for your client um, you know we want to sort of put ourselves in their position understand what their needs are of course we ask questions to do that and then we want to be honest about what's the right tool for them you know it's I don't any one tool is not the right tool for every situation so um, it, it shouldn't you shouldn't be coming from the how do we make this Drupal how do we make this project into a Drupal project you should reverse that and say, does Drupal make the most sense for this? And of course, for us and for many of y'all, oftentimes it does because it's a very powerful tool. Um, like Dr. King said, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards choosing the right tool for the job or something like that. Um, so, you know, of course, in the strategy and design phase, that's when we're selecting the tool, that's when we're doing the thinking, that's when we're asking the questions. Um, and unless it's a client mandate, you know, we don't want to be in this space of, okay, Drupal 8, um, yeah, it's going to be Drupal 8, and we'll figure out how to make it Drupal 8, but you're better off um, thinking about development once you're ready to do that, once you've got the, the things figured out, so you, that's the space you want to be in. And the last bit of about us and marketing, and then we'll get into it, promise. Um, you know, this is, again, what was on our page, what is on our page, and it speaks to web systems, so like we're clearly saying we don't just build in Drupal, and we'll touch on that more. Um, and you know the propels organizations has to do with us figuring out what is the most valuable to a given organization and then build in that way. So let me get a quick um, check from y'all uh, with this nice ambiguously Simpson colored hand. Um, how many were familiar with Jekyll before reading this or coming to this hearing about it? Two, three, some iffiness. So it's about Okay, or five. Well, what counts as familiarity? It just, just awareness. You knew it was a thing that made websites in some way. Definitely. Let's, all right, it seems like about 50%, maybe a little bit more. Okay, cool. 
Uh, how many have used it in any way? I think that's no one. No one proud enough to admit it. Um, okay, more broadly, who's use, who uses tools outside of Drupal to build web applications, whether that interfaces with Drupal, you know, React or something, or totally on its own? Two, three-ish, maybe 25, 50%. Um, so who uses Drupal exclusively for their web? It should be, I guess, the other half there, so. Um, how many of y'all will raise your hand regardless of what I ask? About <laughs> 70. <laughs> Trickier one. How many of y'all won't raise your hand regardless of what I ask? Uh, it's a bit of a paradox. All right, I think I got the info I needed. All right, so some familiarity, fair amount of familiarity with Ju Jekyll, Jukel, a, a merger. Um, no one's building in it, so I'll assume not a lot of knowledge, usage sort of knowledge. Uh, and to put into context really quickly why we chose it, I'll just do a quick uh, run through of our beginning. Um, we started in 2013, 2014, we began, I began working with a couple friends in a co contractor capacity. We had, I had some, accumulated some work and started working with some folks. And we uh, quickly, or over some time, you know, began to formulate, well, all right, we've got enough work and if somebody tries to run a business, then the rest of us can do the work. So let's try, let's give that a try. So that actually uh, culminated in about three years ago. We hired our first two full-time people and had two contractors. Um, and uh, around that time, we started to think, of course, we're going to need a website to talk about ourselves. Um, our director of technology, Costa, who's still uh, with us, um, recommended Jekyll. I looked this up. This was kind of like a fun walk back into the past. I was looking up emails that we wrote to each other and whatnot. Um, and he mentioned he had familiarity with it. He uh, referenced a couple other Drupal agencies, uh, Think Shout and I think Development Seed, if I remember correctly. Development Seed has gone kind of away from Drupal. Um, and they had written about why they chose Jekyll and that sort of thing, so it was familiar. Um, and then very quickly we turned around and uh, did an internal lunch and learn. It was actually our first lunch and learn as a team where Costa was talking about Jekyll and, its, and why it might be a good fit for us. Now mind you, we didn't even have a name or, you know, a logo or any of that stuff during this time. So you can imagine, you know, we've already started working with clients. We need to call ourselves something. It's weird if we have an RFP come in and we're just a group of people without a name, which actually did happen. And we had to explain why we got a name, you know, part of the way in. Um, so you can imagine the pressure that that might put on as far as needing to get a site up. Um, and then I, you know, again, looking back in the logs, uh, sent a, an email to the team saying, all right, here's, our, here's what I have so far for the Jekyll site. I actually sent this email from Tokyo um, on my way for a, an extended vacation, not necessarily perfectly timed with starting a company, but it's a story for another day. Um, so we'll just look at how we evaluated things uh, at that time. What were our needs in 2015? As I already mentioned, you know, get something up yesterday. There was certainly urgency to having a public uh, website that said, hey, we know what we're doing and, you know, please work with us. Um, you know, in some ways this is hastier than ideal. Certainly not how we would look at a project now, whether internal or external. Uh, but I think you could probably relate. Sometimes clients work this way. We did want to limit our costs, you know, to some extent. Uh, Frankly, it's probably sm smarter to think about value overall, but at the time, you know, we didn't have a long track record and we thought we wanted to, um, you know, this was something that was important, something, a simple hosting solution. And we wanted ease of maintenance. We, um, y'all may remember this time when uh, a little thing called Drupal Get-In had just happened. And uh, we're, we, along with everyone else, were a little bit paranoid about, you know, the what it required to maintain a Drupal site, even though, of course, we've been doing it for a very long time. You may recall they, you know, said something like, if you didn't patch your site within 10 minutes, it's safe to assume your children are dead or something. Like, there were these pretty strong, you know, careful, 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 the world's crashing down. Uh, so, you know, we thought about, well, it would be nice to not have to maintain something that had no database back end. <clears throat> and we knew we wanted blog capabilities. Um, 
you know, apart from basic pages, we had to have a blog. Um, and, and, you know, a shortcoming in thinking, uh, looking back, is uh, we only really did think about blog content. So, you know, that's a thing. <laughs> we also, uh, the last uh, point there was we also wanted something we were familiar with. So, of course, we were familiar with Drupal. Um, because, you know, oftentimes the tool that you know how to use is the right tool for the job, right? Um, so we did, did, did want some familiarity. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, you know, we brought enter stage center, Jekyll. Um, there's the timeline again. So Jekyll is a blog aware static site <coughs> generator in Ruby. These are, I think, a little awkwardly worded, but that's what shows up on GitHub. So I'll break that down um, in a second, but Jekyll has been around for 10 years. Um, and this is a correction. I apologize to my local TriDug folks. I said five years when I gave this to them. It actually coincides with the beginning of GitHub. Uh, Tom Preston Werner, who's one of the, I think, three founders of GitHub, was the original creator of Jekyll. And basically, when he was uh, creating Jekyll, he got together with other uh, folks in the Ruby community in San Francisco and started GitHub. Um, and it's, you know, it's used by a lot of sites. Question? Yeah? You showed the tagline, right? Yeah. Was, where does that fall in? Did you have your tagline already established about we build triple sites? That's a good. Or was that something that came after you had more history and already the site was in place? Good question. Um, the question is, I'll repeat it. The tagline, our tagline about uh, propelling organizations with uh, elegant Drupal web systems, we created that later, 2017, and we will touch on that in the timeline. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't off the bat. And just to give a quick context of size, I mean, there are many, many fewer times, fewer sites uh, compared to WordPress or Drupal. There are many fewer Jekyll sites. Um, it's a small enough percentage that's not even really worth mentioning. Um, I think I have a slide at some point, but probably the most popular one you're familiar with is uh, the Bootstrap getbootstrap.com is a Jekyll site. <clears throat> so just breaking that down, it's written in Ruby. Ruby is a programming language, much like PHP. Um, so that's one distinction. Um, it's blog aware. So this basically means it's, this, it, it is a, it's meant to be very simple. And one of the things it knows how to do well is create blog posts. So there's a very simple structure to formulate blog posts in a you know, a straightforward way and serve those. Um, so that's most of what people are using Jekyll Forest to write blogs. Um, and it's a static site generator. So <coughs> in the first time we're describing this, a static site generator essentially is um, a tool that does no server-side processing, right? So you're building your whole site, you're then issuing some sort of build or compile command and whatever that site, whether it be Ruby or PHP or whatever, uh, all that internal processing is just putting out flat files. So HTML, CSS, JavaScript. So again, you can easily serve those flat files from virtually any server in, uh, architecture, and, and there is no you know, interaction with a user profile or, or anything like that. So the whole, whole idea, whole movement of static sites is to just generate flat files and it's really, in, in some ways, is a going back to a simpler web. Uh, just for a little bit more context, uh, and I just changed the slide last time I edited it, had edited it. Um, that's hard to say. The uh, there were thirty-two thousand stars for uh, Jekyll on GitHub, and there's now thirty-three thousand, so it surpassed uh, whatever is in fifty-fifth place. Um, and just for other context, there is this. It's in the realm of this other tool. The hashtag is not the letter L. I won't fully describe it. That tool is actually like 50th in GitHub. And um, you hit the command F word, and it redoes your previously error, aired out command. It's kind of interesting. You should check it out. But I was pretty surprised to see it as popular as it was and as profane as it was. There's Bootstrap. Um, that's a Jekyll site. So you might be asking yourself, why Jekyll? For those of you familiar with the story, or for those of you who can remember me, quickly recap the story. Um, you probably aren't asking yourself that, though, because I didn't ask myself that for three years while I was using it. So 
Um, my question is, does anyone know why it's called Jekyll? Lots of no's. Slightly shaking, shaking heads. That's as good of a guess as I have. I'm, I'm fairly confident that nobody knows this. Mm -hmm. um, if you have anyone, any information on it, I would love to hear it. But I went to the docks. Jekyll is only, Mr. Hyde is only in the configuration file like twice. You know, I looked at the founder, he went back to GitHub, checked out his profile, checked out his blog, nothing. I went to Twitter, couldn't find, you know, they've got a Twitter account, couldn't find anything. Um, posted to their forum. Hey, you know, does anyone know why Jekyll is named Jekyll? Nothing. I haven't tried IRC, and I kind of love this. Um, there was someone in the channel who writes sort of this lengthy guess, and he ends it with, but I really just made that up out of sheer boredom. So <laughs> what I learned is there are bored people in IRC and that are also willing to chime in and give you a hand, uh, which was not terribly surprising, but I still have no idea why it's called Jekyll. And that's, I think, strange for something that's been around for 10 years, but it's true. All right, so looking under the hood uh, quickly, and this is a bicycle brake hood. Um, there are, I just want to focus on a few quick directory structures and then move on. Um, the, and those are config YAML, the layouts directory, the post directory, the site directory, and additionally, any HTML or markdown file. So the config YAML file, you could liken to the Drupal settings.php file. It's going to be where you put in your site specific configuration. What do you call your site? What's an email? You know, that should be used as a contact. Various sort of high level configurations. There's a layouts directory, and in there you would put theme like files, right? Templates that have some, um, you know, it's liquid. Liquid is the templating engine in Jekyll uh, versus Twig in Drupal. So, you, you know, that's where you've got your sort of uh, mostly HTML with little variable drop ins. Um, there's the posts file, <clears throat> which uh, is where blog posts are written. So each blog post is just its own file, uh, individual file with um, some metadata at the top. And that's what I'm showing here in, in Jekyll. This is called front matter. So there's just a means of putting at the top of any file uh, essentially any metadata that, that may be helpful for that file to generate. So in this, in this case, <coughs> this is a blog post. tells it, the, meta, the front matter talks about um, the layout, the title, the date, who authored it, what are some tags you want to put on it, what's a summary, um, you know, for little snippets, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's the site directory. So once you, as I mentioned before, you do your compile, your build, everything gets put into the site directory. Um, so this, again, means any basic, basic hosting infrastructure could, will be served from that site's directory. <coughs> the nice thing with Jekyll coinciding with the building of GitHub is that GitHub pages, um, it, it, <coughs> GitHub pages serves for free uh, Jekyll sites. So if you um, basically, they make it really easy for you to, uh, whatever's on your master branch, whatever you merge into your master branch, and that goes into the underscore site directory, that is what will be served from your GitHub pages. So you've got the nice aspects of GitHub being able to just merge and you know do pull requests, and as long as those go into master, boom, they're deployed. Um, quick aside, does anyone know why the Octocat has five legs? And it's called an Octocat? I don't either, but it definitely has five legs. Let's look that up. Um, I was like, all right, this is the Jekyll cat. Wait, this thing's Octocat, but it has five. Anyway, quick aside, we're moving on. Um, another, just maybe one, I think, last thing I'll talk about in the Jekyll ecosystem is just this uh, bundler, which is the Ruby gem, which manages other gems in the Ruby world, um, which is, you can liken mostly to Drupal modules, a means of programmatically really easily pulling in other uh, kind of enhancements to the site. So this is a more simplified sort of trimmed down compared to Drupal, but you know, for example, we we leveraged uh, HTML proofer, which will check for link accuracy in all your files or 
GitHub pages is a, is a gem that you need to install to deploy to GitHub. Um, we've got like a Twitter, Jekyll Twitter plugin, and you can just put the Twitter link from a specific post and it'll do all the nice uh, Twitter fanciness. So those are, that's kind of the plugin uh, space or module space. So what do we like about Jekyll? Lots. Um, why it worked for us in 2015, uh, the database free component is definitely pretty compelling. I talked about how that, you know, it can be very performant, a site can be very performant if there's no server side rendering. Um, one of the nicest things is it mitigates security risk. We talk about being afraid of Drupal Geddon, the OWASP uh, top 10 web risks as of 2017. Uh, three of them are mitigated by not having a database, the, the first, second, and fifth. For, um, in, in other words, the most prevalent, the second most prevalent, the fifth most prevalent vulnerabilities. And the first one is SQL injection. So without a database, you're, you're free from SQL injection. Um, lower maintenance costs without the database, right? You can host on GitHub for free. Um, and I say general familiarity. There... Uh, not not everyone and no one actually on the team was a Ruby expert by any means. You don't really have to in interact deeply with Ruby to be able to successfully operate a Jekyll site. So um, so we were familiar with things like Markdown and YAML and Twig, so the, the overlap there was uh, pretty good. And then again, the, the workflow um, of being able to just merge pull requests was really nice and really easy and was really familiar with the team uh, and really efficient as well. Um, and it did work for us at the time because all of our team were developers, right? Familiar with the command line, comfortable with that, comfortable with getting in the, in the weeds. <clears throat> um, we adopted linters of all sorts. This was something that kind of came into our purview, especially in the Ruby and Jekyll community. Uh, a linter is just basically a tool that looks at your code as it sits, not how it interacts with your um, application, but just as it sits to test if that's you know high quality code. There's linters of all sorts. Um, I think we had, I'll just name a few. There's a markdown linter that we relied on to make sure our sort of styles from our blog pages were consistent. Uh, ESLint is a JavaScript linter. ProseLint is actually a, a linter that will check your blog content so and, and give you some grammar advice and that sort of thing. And it's like really sassy and sarcastic, so I definitely recommend checking it out. It's a lot of fun. And then we've got, um, and it's useful. It's definitely useful, and we don't, you know, you don't always adhere to the recommendations, but they're helpful to be aware of, you know, to be knowledgeable about. <clears throat> and then um, SCSS lint, which speaks for itself, but, you know, it's helped us make our code, keep our code clean and maintainable, and, you know, reduce tech debt over time. Um, there are also, you know, other packages that we relied on. Browser Sync, you may be familiar with, but this is a way to make Jekyll a little bit more uh, Drupal-like in that when you make a change, you see the update quickly because otherwise you have to rebuild and all that, and that can be time-consuming. We've got um, image minimization and uh, optimization packages, things that would minify JavaScript and CSS and all that to help with performance, stuff you get out of the box with Drupal. Um, and then some responsive style images as well. And those are just to name a few. Um, and we did build things on top of it too. So I'll talk about those quickly. Um, we built a custom spell checker using, using uh, GNU's A spell. And there's a, a library for it in many languages. But of course, when you're writing content, you don't want to misspell things. That, you know, they can lose some credibility there. So that was something that, of course, continues to be important to us, and we built a tool around it uh, to run that against every time we built our site to make sure that our spelling is good. And in addition to that, we, we've also modified on top of that where we can add entries to a custom dictionary because, of course, not everything that we talk about is going to be in an English dictionary, but may be valid. Um, <clears throat> We built a living style guide. We used a tool called Hologram, which is um, Trulia built and open sourced. Um, so this was something that while we were in the design process, I was able to interact with just the style guide and the team could you know, go and build the site and I could easily say, oh, this looks good, this doesn't. Um, so it was a really nice tool to use and Hologram specifically, you can just put comments in and that uh, will 
the, you, if you structure your comments in such a way, it, it turns out to mark up on the style guide. So it's like a really easy, easily maintained um, guide. And it was really helpful for me as the client with this. Um, and that's just the, if you can see the image, a quick example of what uh, just one small section of our style guide looked like. Yeah, you can see the tiles and the generated markup and all that. Um, one of the cooler things we built was a um, comment backend. So this was built in Lumen, which is a subset of Laravel, like a micro framework. Um, and then we used SQLite for the comment backend. You might be saying, wait, didn't you say no database? Well, there were limitations. So, um, so and this is something we've open sourced. I'll share that later. Um, sort of a drop in anywhere you've got a, a, a comment back end very simplified just up you know write a comment delete a comment um, at the at the moment I don't think we have reply uh, separate threads but that's coming soon uh, we also built a react front end to the comments um, so react is talking to the uh, what we call squabble that's our back end comment server um, and uh, here's an example of one of our posts of actually about Jekyll and Gulp uh, of you know, bringing in avatars alongside folks' names, kind of formatting things uh, much more nicely than our previous rendition of our comment app, which did, wasn't built off of React. And we uh, sort of simplified the uh, comment editing form, which will which soon, within the next few weeks, will um, roll out a, a WYSIWYG component to that through React. So that was pretty fun and cool. Uh, and we built a, a powerful pre-commit hook, and you may, I was mentioning this a moment ago, but you know, if you think about when do you do QA on a static site generator, it's at time of commit, right? That's kind of uh, when you commit code is when you're updating a blog post or whatever it, the update may be. So our pre-commit hook, which is something you can set up uh, in Git a lot, ran our spell checking and ran our markdown, runs our markdown checking and runs prose checking. Um, and in fact, we even have it checking to see if certain kinds of blog posts that we expect to be tagged in certain ways have those tags. So there's a lot of um, customization that we've done to sort of adhere to the things that are important to us and that happens at commit time. So when you say git commit, um, it'll prompt you and say, hey, you've got these spelling errors, you want to fix them, and, you know, that sort of thing. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> and definitely helpful to the quality of what we're producing, you know, um, specifically the prose. I mean, I've reread stuff I've written 10 times, you know, rewritten 10 times, and somebody else will look at it and make five changes, and then prose will look at it and make a couple changes. So it really does make a difference. Um, yeah, and in the process, we even enjoyed working with it. Um, you know, I think most people uh, these days, certainly developers, folks that like to build things, like to learn new things. As I mentioned earlier, we didn't have to master it. We didn't have to be you know, super, super deeply proficient. But um, you know, learning a new tool, being more familiarized with another ecosystem just helps you think in those kind of structural ways and exposes you to, to, to more. Uh, and I do think you know, we've already seen some of those impacts I've already talked about of things that we bring into our Drupal world that we probably otherwise wouldn't have. Um, there were certainly parallels. There were, you know, liquid, as I mentioned, liquid templates are very similar to Twig, and, and we had more experience earlier with liquid, so it made our kind of Drupal 8 onboarding a little bit simpler in that way. Some of the, you know, the Node package system, which we rely on, and the Ruby Gems uh, bundler package system are very similar to, um, <coughs> excuse me, Composer, so interaction and familiarity with that helped. Um, some of the things you get for free with Drupal means you don't have to think about them that much. Um, so it's sort of, you know, we specifically on the performance end of things, we really had to get down to some fundamentals, uh, a fundamental understanding that I think enriched uh, several members of our team in the performance aspect. Um, so folks like that. And I pulled this quote, uh, you know, asked for feedback about uh, present this presentation from the team, and I pulled this qu quote from and on our team who says it, it absolutely helped me become a better developer. So, you know, a good thing to hear, and I think reinforces that, that strength of not being too, too narrowly focused. 
Um, so this gets on the question you were asking a, a bit ago, which was we did redesign our site back to the timeline here in, in time for DrupalCon 2017 in Baltimore. And at that time, we, you know, we basically released it the day of DrupalCon. We were working to redesign it until then. Uh, we had hired a, a designer, Oksana, who's wonderful. Um, months before that, and we were sort of in the feeling that, you know, our website's not really reflecting the kind of quality of design and work we can do. So that was the motivation then. And, um, you know, there was enough inertia and stuff we had built into Jekyll, and we were still liking it a lot uh, that we decided, all right, let's stick with it. Clearly, this is, you know, a redesign is often a time that we think about re retooling the whole thing. That's, you know, certainly what, how we uh, talk about that with our clients as well. So, so what about the present? <clears throat> um, I'll talk quickly about retrospectives, uh, a retrospective look, and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap up with uh, where we go. Um, so there were, there certainly were drawbacks to this approach, and we'll touch on those. The first one is highly, you know, it is highly technical. Uh, that's a relative term. Probably most folks in this room would feel comfortable with it, but um, not not everyone would. And as we think about building our team, you know, we're, we're looking to hire a marketing director. This person isn't expected to be a developer as well or have familiarity with the command line. So administering a Jekyll site, the way it is um, de by default is not, super simple for a non-technical person. There are workarounds, but any of them will not be as simple as, you know, working with a Drupal 8 site and logging in. Um, we definitely had to build things that you get for free in Drupal. Um, I was giving a talk at DrupalCon a couple of years ago, and I talked about this tool called Kokomo, which is supposed to be a, <clears throat> is used to evaluate how much effort and, and expense goes into building a software tool. Um, so it looks at lines of code and that sort of thing. Um, and Drupal was, you know, some 200 person years worth of code, some $10 million worth of expense looking at like the Drupal 8 project at that point. So you get a ton for free and it can be easy to forget about that as you're thinking about building different platforms. Um, we, you know, we had to build our own commenting infrastructure, which I walked through. We could have, we've written a blog post about this, we could have used a different JavaScript drop-in like Discuss, but there are certainly drawbacks to not having your data um, and what they, you know, privacy concerns if that's something that you care about. Um, and there are, you know, other, <coughs> other options to discuss as well. But we had to build our own image optimization, so there are some stuff that we got through the Jekyll um, community, but there was some further refinement that we had to do in our build process, uh, in our Travis, um, CI builds, uh, and similarly, you don't get as much for free. No admin UI, that's a separate thing. Uh, no drag and drop interface with blocks or any of that, of course. You know, internationalization is a pretty profound thing that comes with Drupal, so if you're trying to do multilingual sites, you know, it's huge. We wouldn't do that in Jekyll. Uh, you get a lot of accessibility baked into Drupal, especially eight, that um, frankly, you're a little bit more on your own with Jekyll. Um, forms aren't a thing, you know, unless you're similarly doing a JavaScript drop-in like you would with a comment system. Forms, there's no server-side processing, so forms are a challenge. Search, there's no search. There's a means to get search, but that's another JavaScript library. Um, even things as simple as anything dynamic, you know, we wanted to do rotating quotes. You can't do that unless you rebuild the site every time or you do some JavaScript manipulation of the page. And, um, you know, maybe one of the biggest drawbacks was we didn't get to work in Drupal 8 as much as we would have wanted to. Um, even in checking this just a week ago, there's still four times as many Drupal 7 sites as there are Drupal 8 out there. So there's still client demand for work in those in Drupal 7. So, you know, rewind two years, it might have been, in some ways, it would have been more beneficial to be able to put more time, experimentation, learning time into our own internal tools. Um, and we didn't get that opportunity. I, I like this quote, uh, which is a similar theme here from uh, All Things Open's Open Conference, which is in Raleigh, near where I live. Um, big open source conference. Ed Finkler says, uh, be liberal about learning new technologies and approaches and be conservative about using them. 
um, you know, you want to be learning all, all the time, and it's helpful to be learning uh, easier, less risky to be learning internally. If you're doing that outside uh, on client work, you know, there's more risk there. And just building the site uh, sometimes, you know, you've got to, every time you want to deploy, you've got to regenerate, and we've gotten to a pretty complex generation system at this point. So um, it, it's timely, and it's starting to get to be too much for us uh, into the future. <coughs> One potential compromise is we could have built the site in Sculpin, which is a PHP static site generator, which would have gotten us for, you know, rewind three years, more familiarity with object-oriented PHP, which might have smoothed the transition to Drupal 8. So that's something we could have done, but we didn't. Uh, to, to bring it through in the end, where do we go from here with Dr. King? Um, I think what we're looking for now is more diverse content, content types. Obviously, that is a really big strength of Drupal compared to almost any other tool. We're thinking beyond just blog posts, but we want to be able to create, you know, webinars and white papers and, you know, case studies and all that. We've built those in custom ways in Jekyll, but we're probably outgrowing that complexity. Um, again, with, with bringing on a non-technical person, being able to edit, administer a site with a login is beneficial. And more interactivity, we are looking to, for folks who are engaging with the site, engaging with our content. We want to have the opportunity to have forums, have them say, hey, I'm interested in this thing. Hey, contact me. Um, so again, there's workarounds for this in Jekyll, but uh, it is kind of pushing us more towards the Drupal 8 world. And the truth is we, we aren't certain which way we're going to go at this point. Um, this will be, you know, we've invested a lot and a lot of it works well for us, but we're also in some ways outgrowing the complexity. Um, so this will be a decision that will be discussed with our, you know, marketing director when we bring them on. Um, on the good side, you know, Technology changes uh, so rapidly, so you need to sort of be informed uh, constantly about what's out there and what's new, so it doesn't benefit uh, knowledge, you know, 20, 30 years of knowledge, the web changes so fast. Um, so we will be evaluating this over time, but we don't have a certain, a certain certainty at this point. Um, so I'll just share a few insights, and then we'll wrap. Um, <clears throat> One, um, one insight that seems relevant to our situation is, um, uh, sorry, the WordPress comparison. F WordPress, people often, in it, the, the stats and numbers show that it's easier and quicker to get spun up on WordPress, right? Um, but there are some limitations and you're trying to do some deep technical work. So I think we're, we're kind of in that paradigm where Jekyll is our WordPress. Um, you know, we try to tell our clients to think three years out and be thinking that way. Um, so hindsight, hindsight. hindsight is definitely 2020. So we are three years out from where we were. And we maybe it would have done things differently, but it definitely got us up running quickly. And it felt, you know, it's similar to that simplistic WordPress comparison. I think the biggest uh, parallel for what's much more talked about in the Drupal community is headless Drupal. Um, you know, this is where you'll need to, there's a lot of strength, there are a lot of strengths to the headless approach, but you also are throwing, you know, the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, so you need to be very uh, cognizant of what are some of the risks, what are you losing with headless, what are the additional complexities that you don't uh, think about, and <clears throat> that you may not think about when you're just saying, oh, this is what is great about this tool. So you definitely see some content out there about those who've done a lot of headless work talking about some of the drawbacks and some of the struggles that they've had. So I think, I think that mind frame um, that we've gone through will be helpful for us and I think should be helpful for y'all as you're considering headless. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, inertia is, was definitely a factor. Um, you know, it's not where, it's never where you want to be with let's just keep building on this thing because it's what we have, but again, a lot of, in a lot of cases, that's what where clients are at. We certainly have clients that come to us that love Drupal, and they're saying we got to go with you know Drupal, so let's stay there. Um, so you know we can relate to our clients in that way. But you also, you know, when you're thinking about the value of ownership, don't want to just say 
since we're on this, let's set, let's stay. Um, you really should be thinking longer term than that. Um, but I'd say regardless of which way we go, uh, time's up, in my opinion, uh, to, to build only in Drupal. Um, you hear Dries talking about decoupled, you know, headless decoupled all the time and many other leaders. The API first initiative was very much with this mentality that other things would be talking to Drupal. Uh, you know, officially announcing Dries again about adopting React for the admin backend, um, you know, certainly points to Drupal is a part of a larger ecosystem that we should consider using for tools. And even in the state of the Drupal uh, survey that, they, that Dries and Acquia puts out each year, it showed 50% of folks talking about building, using other tools besides Drupal. Um, and this is a slide from that presentation. Node.js, you know, Angular, Symfony, React, um, you know, a handful of those that we're using. So. Time's definitely, time's definitely up for uh, gross men getting away with impunity, their um, inappropriate actions, but it's certainly also up for just thinking only Drupal, even within the Drupal community. Um, all right, so we're coming to a wrap. Um, you certainly, I'll have a resources slide after this, but that's our, our site, so a lot of what I've talked about um, is in our open source repository, so you can check us out. Um, and a list of, you know, I mentioned uh, the comment front end that's in React that's available on our, you know, our, our GitHub repo. Uh, the pre-commit hook is in the site. Uh, the dictionary work is in the site. The comment server, which I mentioned, is Squabble. Um, and then there's some more resources about static site generators, Jekyll. Um, I got a link to the Everyday I'm Drupalin video, which definitely, when no one's around, check that out later. And I even like these two puns of, you're probably familiar with the search solar. Lunar is a search tool that can plug into Jekyll, which is a JavaScript entirely. It's pretty cool and slick. Um, and Hide is a, let's see, it's a, it's a static site generator written in Python. Yeah, I found out about that as well in the process. Boom, the end, I wanted to give uh, thanks to uh, my local Drupal Meetup, the Tri Doug Meetup, for helping me run through this and giving me some feedback. Um, Oksana for helping me with the slides. And uh, the team uh, snuck in some React comment updates in the last couple days to make, our, to make that look a little slicker. So appreciate that, y'all. And I'll take any questions. And I'll repeat them. Yes? Do you use the idea that you? didn't build your site in Drupal as a selling point about like the depth of expertise that your team has. Yeah, so is it is the idea that we didn't build our site in Drupal, can that be a selling point? <clears throat> and someone asked a similar question who knows me better, so he said like, aren't you supposed to be eating your own dog food at our local meetup? Um, I think so, because I think what it states is we aren't you know, I've covered this in the talk, but it, we aren't just fitting you into the Drupal box. We're going to try to figure out what makes what makes the most sense for your needs. And we will tell people who are asking us for Drupal and we don't think it's the right choice, that it's not the right choice. And sometimes that means they'll pursue other things with us and sometimes they'll go elsewhere. Um, so I think it is, it's not so much that we, we can't say we're experts in all of the things all the time, but what we can more easily say is we'll be honest in that evaluation of what is the right tool for you. Again, 95% of our projects are Drupal, so the people who are looking to work with us are looking for Drupal expertise. But we've had a few Jekyll you know, proposals out there in, in the last six months and for simpler sites that folks don't have a maintenance budget for and that sort of thing. Um, so I think it can be. Thanks. Benji, you gotta have something. You don't have to. It's your choice. Anyone else? Any other questions? Cool. Thanks, y'all. Appreciate appreciate you coming. And it's a wrap. Do we go get beer or pizza now?